and we fall flat on our face, our brain learns that was the wrong recruitment pattern. I did not have enough force. I didn't get a strong enough signal. I've got to generate more or less force. Right. So we use these receptor organs constantly, all right? They're firing all the time in your bodies right now, sending information to your brain. You've got them in the muscles in your hands, sending information about the amount of force you're generating while you're holding your pencil, all right? All the time. So muscle spindle then lies actually within a skeletal muscle. And it lies in parallel to those muscle fibers that we were looking at last week. All right. And it's sort of attached to the muscle via the connective tissues. So it's a little mini muscle within the muscle. And the purpose of a muscle spindle is to tell the central nervous system about the amount of stretch or length of the muscle or the speed that it's being stretched at. Okay. So we see more firing in a muscle spindle when the muscles stretch very, very quickly than when we stretch it slowly. Okay. And it is responsible, that signal that it sends, is responsible for initiating a contraction within the muscle very, very quickly. Right? So when I stretch the muscle, the central nervous system sends a signal back to contract the muscle as a protective mechanism. Right? Because the central nervous system can't work out whether or not that stretch is going to keep going and result in the muscle being torn apart. So it sends a signal back to contract the muscle quickly to try to prevent it from getting torn. So we have what we call a stretch reflex. If I stretch a skeletal muscle, I see a contraction. We use it all the time and it works in um, alongside that stretch shortening cycle that we talked about that's caused by the elastic component of the connective tissue in the muscle. So now I've got the stretch shortening cycle and I have a stretch reflex and those can allow me, if I time them right and I use them properly, allows me to generate a lot more power and force in a skill. Right, so stretch reflex, um, if you, you can do just on your hand, right? If you stretch your fingers, they flip back, right? Part of that is stretch shortening, part of that is the stretch reflex. And you can use it, we use it when we throw. If you watch gymnastics on the television when they're working, um, Asymmetric bars, if you watch the girls come through the bottom of the bar, they'll often have their feet ever so slightly behind their hips because that puts a stretch on the hip which can then generate a more forceful kick up the front to help them get over the top of the bar or include a somersault. Right. So we often, when we think of technique and when we think of biomechanics in a skill, Oftentimes we are talking about biomechanics and skill technique in a way that utilizes stretch reflex without thinking about that other component of it. Right. So we use the pre-stretch in our plyometric training just like we use the stretch shortening cycle. All right, if I stretch and I contract straight away, I'm also pulling in that stretch reflex. Okay, so when we do um, a jump takeoff for a basketball throw, we're using stretch reflex in our quads and our 
ankles. The other really clever thing that the signal does from the spindle is it turns off the antagonist, right? So it inhibits the antagonist. And I'll come back to that in a minute because I want to contract the thing that's being stretched, but there's no point in me trying to contract a muscle if the muscle on the other side is contracting. So actually that signal from the spindle does two things when it gets to the spinal cord. The other one we're interested in in particular when we're looking at force production for sports skills is the Golgi tendon organ. All right, the Golgi tendon organ lies at the junction where the muscle is turning, is um, transitioning into connect, all that connective tissue is kind of joining up to make the tendon. And it is responsible for uh, recognizing tension within the tendon, but that relates to the force production in the muscle, right? Because the only tension in the tendon is coming from the force you're making in the muscle that's getting transferred to the bone via the connective tissue, right? So indirectly, it's responding to tension in the muscle as well, or force production in the muscle. Okay. And again, it acts in some respects as a protective mechanism as well as feedback and information for the brain for motor patterning, right? Because if I create too much force and there's too much tension on the tendon, then a couple of problems can happen. Either the tendon will rupture or the tendon can hold out and that force gets transmitted to the bone and the bone breaks. So you see that occasionally there was uh, a well-known picture, but I don't know who it was. Um, a few years ago, there was a pitcher um, who threw a ball and as he released the ball, his arm broke. Right? Because the amount of force he had applied to the ball, the bone wasn't strong enough to take. Probably that had something to do with some substances he might not have chosen to take, but the idea is the same thing, all right? So without the Golgi tendon organ operating properly, chances are that you get either a tendon injury or a bone break. And when we look at some resistance training techniques, and uh, stretching techniques, what we some of what those techniques are trying to do now is as we understand how the GTO works, we're trying to train in a way that inhibits that signaling from the GTO. Right? So think about if if it's responding to force and I'm doing a weight training program. The whole point of a weight training program is to increase force production, right? So I'm either looking to increase just force or I'm looking to increase force and speed and I'm looking for power. But either way, I've got to increase force production. Well, the spindle makes the muscle contract the GTO, because it's responding to tension, sends a signal to the spinal cord and we get a signal back from the central nervous saying, okay, relax now, there's too much going on here, you need to chill out. Right? So if I'm in the middle of my really massive bench press and I'm getting really strong and I just put on like 50 pounds on the bar and I'm pushing and I'm generating all that extra force, and then my central nervous system tells my muscles to relax, what happens to the rock? I'm straight down on my face. This might not be good. Okay. So we know that when we do weight training, 
that part of what is occurring is the brain's ability to either not pay as much attention to this or to damp down the amount of signal that's coming from it. Muscle. 
and sliding filament theory is not occurring, all the calcium is where? Where's the calcium stored? If the muscle's not firing and the calcium isn't flooding out and attaching to the actin, where's the calcium? Go for it. You've got two choices. It's either right or it's wrong. It, it's not a big deal. It's in the circle, Oh, close. 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 It's in the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Right? So, when I'm at rest, the calcium is all stored away in that sarcoplasmic reticulum and we don't see sliding filament theory. Alright? We don't see that muscle contraction. And there's no movement. In, there's no change in the length of the muscle when it's at rest. Okay? If we are creating an isometric contraction. Right? When I do isometrics, anybody do any kind of isometric training? All right, so if I'm pushing against the wall as hard as I can, that's isometric training. Right? I can push against myself as hard as I can, that's isometric training. Right? So when I'm doing isometric contractions, the muscle does not change in length. That means that the force I'm able to create with my muscles equals the force that's pushing back. So when we do this chest push one, right, it's difficult to do it for yourself. But if we do this one and one arm was a lot stronger, one arm would move, right? If I'm able to keep my hands in the middle, it means I'm relatively evenly balanced. If I try to pick up something that is very, very heavy and it doesn't budge, that's an isometric contraction, right? Because you're generating force, but the force you're trying to shift is equaling the force you're able to generate. Does that make sense? So I don't see any movement because they equal each other. Right? In a concentric contraction, so this is our typical sliding filament picture. Right? When, I, when we look at those pictures in the book and when we looked at that animation, this is the picture we're seeing. Right? So in a concentric contraction, the muscle shortens in length. That means then that the force that the muscle was able to generate was larger than the resistive force. So when we do power training, when we do strength training, typically what we are concentrating on is that concentric. Can I put more weight on the bar? More weight equals more force created in the muscle if I can move the bar. Right? So if I'm pushing five pounds and I add another five pounds, then I'm able to generate enough force to now move 10 pounds. And we keep putting weight on the bar if we're doing a 1RM test, we keep putting weight on the bar until we can't do that more than once. Right? And then if you add more weight on the bar, the bar doesn't move. Because now I can't generate enough force to move the bar. That makes sense? Right? That's, that's why a 1RM test is the measure of strength, the measure of force you can generate. Because as soon as you put more weight, you can't move it now. Our third option then, when we're looking at contraction, is if the muscle is lengthening under force. And that's called an eccentric contraction. 
And in this case, what happens is that the force of the muscle that the muscle can produce is less than the force that is being applied to the muscle. And so the muscle doesn't turn off and relax and just get stretched. It keeps trying to contract, but because the external force is larger, the muscle gets pulled longer rather than getting shorter. So if we look at a force velocity curve, this then, this idea of these three types of contractions becomes very interesting because if we take out our zero movement plan, our isometric contraction, right, there's, we said the muscle does not lengthen, but the muscle creates force. It's just the equivalent force. Okay, so there's no change in length in an isometric contraction. Right. If we look at the speed at which I'm shortening, so if I'm looking at a concentric contraction, at any speed, the amount of force I can produce in a concentric contraction is less than that muscle can do isometrically. So initially when we start moving, we see a big drop in force and then the faster we go, gradually that curve kind of eases out a little bit. But you can see here that far less force than I can produce in an isometric. If we look at eccentric contraction, eccentric movement in the muscle, then as soon as I start moving, I can create more force. And the faster I go, the more force I get, and then it eases out there as I get really fast. So an eccentric lengthening in the muscle is always more force than an isometric and always more force than a concentric at any velocity, right? So it doesn't matter what movement you're looking at, the eccentric portion of that movement creates more force than the concentric. When we're strength training and we're concentrating on this concentric, the goal is, depending on whether you're working for strength or power or both, right? The goal is to try to shift this curve up here so that I can create more force. So when we do a typical resistance program, we're trying to move this force velocity curve up and to the right a little bit. Because I want to be able to create more force at a faster speed because strength times speed is power. And most of the time, power is really important if we're training athletes. Right? There's not very many sports where we're only interested in speed or strength. Right? Usually in our field, we want power. So it's important to train the whole range. I've got to train some fast stuff, right? And I've got to train some slow, heavy stuff so that I work the whole curve, not just part of the curve. So, the force velocity curve gives us some understanding of what happens when we see soreness in the muscle because we often set our training programs based upon this side of the curve, except most movements go both ways, right? And so if I push something up, I also have to let it down. 
So I have to do this as well as this. And if we're concentrating on putting lots of weight on here, we can do some damage on the eccentric side. So when I see soreness, we get two kinds of soreness. Right? The first one is very short-lived, very acute. You're down in the gym and you're training really hard and you feel a bit tight and a little bit uncomfortable. Right? And generally, within an hour or so of coming out of the gym, that feeling goes away. <coughs> right? That's not really soreness. The one we're more concerned about is delayed onset muscle soreness, DOMS. And this is the one where um, you were sick for a couple of weeks, so you didn't train very hard, and then you come back and you go crazy when you come back. Or you took the summer off, and you go crazy when you come back into pre-season. Or when you finish in college, you go out and get a job, and you realize there's not time to train, and eight months later you're like, oh, oh, I probably should get back in the gym, and you try to lift the weight that you lifted a year ago. Right? And you come out of the gym and you're like, oh yeah, that felt good, I am cool, this is great, I can do this, I'm gonna get back in shape. Next day you wake up and you're like, ooh, okay, that feels a little bit tight, that's good, I worked hard and I feel good. And then the next day you wake up and you're like, oh my God, I can't get dressed, I can't move my arms. Right? Or, or you're squatting and you get to you have to like go down to the loo and then once you're on the loo you can't get back up again <laughs> and you're stuck there because your legs are so sore. Right? That's dawns. Okay? So we've all been there. Yeah. Like trying to get your shirt on and you can't move your you're like, okay, that one. So, soreness somewhere between 12 and 48 hours, all right? And it's linked to the eccentric portion of the movements you were doing. So, downhill running, if you run the hills outside here, going downhill will make you more sore than going uphill, all right? Well, we don't make that connection very often because if I go up the hill, I have to come back down the hill in order to go up the hill again, right? So then we get really, really sore and we'll go, oh God, that running up that hill made me so sore. It wasn't running up the hill that made you sore, it's coming back down the hill that makes you sore, right? So the going up the hill makes you strong and gets you aerobically fit, but coming down the hill is the thing that makes you sore because on the down portion, there's a lot of eccentric loathing on the glutes and on the quads. When we work a negative program in the gym, right? If, you do an, if you're advanced enough in your weight training program to be messing around with negatives, that's an eccentric loading program. All right, I pile tons of weight on the bar, I go down as slow as I can, you can't do it without a partner because I can create more force eccentrically than I can concentrically. So the amount of force I can take down on the bench press is more than I can push back up again. So if I'm doing an eccentric loading program, I have to have a partner because otherwise I ain't getting back out from underneath the bar. Okay. Okay. So when we do eccentric work, that is high intensity, what we see is some structural damage in the muscle. So we see little micro tears in the muscle. And when the tear occurs, it means those proteins that we looked at, our actin and myosin, and the other structural proteins are all kind of out of whack with each other. And so we can't generate as much force as normal. Also, we see some calcium issues if the sarcoplasmic reticulum gets torn. But because of the micro tears, we get some anti-inflammatory responses and some irritants that are released, chemicals from within the muscle cell that are released and float around. So we get all this soreness 
not because of lactic acid or lactate, which is what our coaches like to tell us, that's got nothing to do with being sore, right? It's because of the damage that we do and the response to the damage that occurs. We get some swelling inside the muscle that presses on the nose, that hurts. We get these irritants, causes some inflammation. And we've got structural damage. So then what happens is if you're this, if you're sore, when you go back in the gym, you can't push as much work. Well, that's okay if you're in a training phase, right? It's a little less safe if you're in a competition phase because you have to go out and work. You can't afford for your performance to be subpar, right? Plus, if there's that structural damage and you're sore and you're not quite paying attention because it's sore, that's when you get hurt. So we've got to be a little bit careful about DOMS. Okay? We can use a training principle, a progressive overload, particularly that term is used in conjunction with resistance exercise programs, but the same idea can be used in any kind of program, all right? Instead of starting out with a lot of volume or a lot of intensity, so lots of weight, I start out at a lower intensity and or less volume. And then I gradually add weight as we go along, and then we would see hopefully none, but certainly less dogs. Now, we don't always have the time for that, right? When, if I'm in college and I've only got three weeks to get my athletes in shape before the first game, I don't have time to be nice and give them progressive overload training. So we get dumped in the deep end and then we're all walking around like this for the first week of school because right? we can't move. Because they don't have time to do the right thing and take it slowly. In more for the little diagrams, actually, for the little pictures of the actin myosin than for the actual graph. Although the graph does show you something quite interesting about the point in the movement where I'm able to produce the most amount of force. Right? If you go back earlier in the slideshow, we had that one slide that was like a big version of this. Go back and have a look at that in conjunction with this diagram and then you'll see what I'm talking about. Here is the optimal range for this particular skill for cross-bridge formation. See the overlap of the myosin and the actin. So the more cross-bridges I can form, the more force I can produce. At this point in the skill, the muscles stretched out so far, there's very little overlap, so I can't create a lot of cross bridges. <coughs> and here there's too much overlap, so I can't make as many cross bridges. Right? So here and here are weaker than here. In a bicep curl, this point of the skill is around about 100 degrees. So the point in a bicep curl where you're able to generate the most amount of force is about 100 degrees. Give or take, all right? People's me internal mechanics play a role because everybody has a bicep insertion on the humerus, but some of us have the bicep insertion further away from the elbow than others. Some of them, the tendon is shorter, right? So there's personal mechanics that play a role but somewhere around 100 degrees. Okay. When you go to the gym, you can see that happen. Right? Because people cheat on their bicep curls all the time. Okay. So you'll see the guy with loads of weight on the bar and he bounces the bar off of his legs because the muscle is quite weak here and it's quite strong here. 
So when he lowers the weight down, he now, he's got enough weight to train this, but he can't get it from here to here. So he has to bounce it off his legs. Similarly, you'll see people who finish the curl and then drop the bar off the top of the curl because they can't control the amount of weight they've got on the bar in the top part of the contraction. Right. So depending on the skill, if it's a squat, it's not 100 degrees. Right? Every skill that you watch has this optimal range where that part, that section of the skill is at its strongest. the other one, chin-ups. Okay. Who watches the people in the gym go? Right, well that's great, but they're only training here. And when we do sports skills, we don't do things in little tiny kind of ranges of motion, because the big range of motion is biomechanically more efficient. So if I don't train this and this, that's where you get hurt when you go out on the field. I'm thinking that's enough. There's kind of going on here. All right, so on Wednesday, we will pick up with adaptations that we see with aerobic training. And then we will start on the nervous system, which is chapter five. Okay.